wishing I had a lightsaber up here. Looks yeah, great up there, there, but I yeah. needed one up here. I've got one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't, no, I don't have that one. Work. It just have to use your imagination with that okay. one, yes. <laughs> so basically what I did there, I sort of handed you the mantle, didn't I? Which is what these people are so excited about, that you've just taken that off, really. And that's why everybody's so pleased to see you. You are the future. Well, listen, this is a daunting proposition, and <laughs> I can't do this without every single one of you out there. I have to say, the minute I came here yesterday, and this is the first time I've been to Celebration, I was just completely overwhelmed at what I was looking at. What what you as fans have created and how exciting it is to, to see the quality of the work and the commitment to Star Wars. It's the kind of thing we talk about every single day when we sit down and, and discuss the story and look to see where we're going with the future of Star Wars. Um, I, I, it's really, it means a great deal to us and I can see that it means a tremendous amount to you. So that's something that we want to protect. Wow. Well, we'll come on to Star Wars a little bit later in the discussion, but uh, you know, looking at the, uh, the retrospective of your work there, you know, we're reminded of how many amazing projects you've been involved with throughout the years that have, uh, have been part of us growing up and, and part of our movie-going experience for so many years. Growing up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, um, but where did it all start for you? I mean, you know, was there a moment in your life that you suddenly said, this is what I want to do, I want to be a filmmaker? What was your inspiration? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because I actually grew up in a pretty small town. So I, I didn't grow up in an environment where everybody was working in Hollywood. I don't come from Los Angeles. It's not something that anybody in my family did. So um, it really, I, I suppose, it sort of evolved over time. I took some classes in college, just like many film students or aficionados, I'm sure, here in the audience. And one thing after another, I just, I, I became more and more interested in telling stories through cinema. And I went to see Close Encounters. And that is the movie that really galvanized my interest in wanting to get into the movie business. And then. I know that my story sounds almost made up because one of the first people I met soon after I graduated was Steven Spielberg. And I started working on the movie 1941 as a production assistant and working specifically with John Milius, who was the executive producer at the time. And after that association, Steven asked me to come work for him. And the first script he put in front of me was Raiders of the Lost Ark. So that pretty much catapulted me into the movie business, and and it's it's just been an incredible ride ever since. Now that was your first, the first time you met George. You were you were working as associate to Stephen. Of course, you were there between these two giants of the industry. What was that like for you on one of your first films? It was pretty amazing. I mean, Stephen. Stephen had already done Jaws and Close Encounters. George was just coming off of Star Wars. And I was just getting started in the movie business. So it, it was uh, quite overwhelming to be in the midst of those two. And then it's where I met Frank, who I eventually married. Um, so I, I, I was surrounded by some pretty powerful men. Um, but I did find my own way. You know, <laughs> but I, I had fantastic mentorship. There's no question that, that there was a, a real guidepost there on every level, um, and they all gave me incredible support. And what was your your first impression of George when you met him? Was uh, was there was there anything that you could tell us? You know, the great thing about George, and I really feel that this is still who he is, is. He's just constantly full of ideas. And I think that there, it's no surprise the level of innovation that's gone on inside his company and the things that, that he and his company has been responsible for all these years because he never turns it off. There's just constantly a flow of ideas. Mm, oh, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, what's it, what's it like for you? I mean, you've you, you produced so many, so many great films throughout the years. I mean, uh, as, as, as we saw the Cheering at the films that we've enjoyed. I mean, many of them I grew up with. 
through, the 80s in particular. Um, what is it about a particular project that you're drawn to? Uh, you know, because your films are so diverse as well. You know, you've created these huge, you know, what we typify as blockbusters, and then there's the, the, the more historical projects as well. What draws you to these different projects? You know, I, I think in, in so many ways, I, I'm attracted to the kind of movies that I like to go see. That, that's usually how it starts. And I tend to have very, very eclectic tastes. I'm interested in lots of different kinds of movies and lots of different kinds of stories. I can get just as excited about making a movie like Jurassic Park as I can about talking about doing a movie like Lincoln. And I think that that's what it is. It, it keeps changing. It's always interesting. Um, I think the great thing about making movies is it carries you into an experience that you might never have had in your lifetime and you get to meet people involved in lots of different walks of life. And so those, those are the things. It's a complete experience. That's what I love about it. Yeah, absolutely. And then many of the films that you've worked on, of course, have broken new ground as far as you know, technology and visual effects goes, etc. You know, what's it like going into a project, perhaps not completely knowing how you're going to solve a particular problem? I mean, your, your expertise, I guess, as a producer is in problem solving. Well, I, I think the greatest thing, I love it when I read a script and I think it's fantastic and then I set it down and I say to myself, oh my God, how are we going to do that? And that's, I, I, that's very much the way we felt with Jurassic Park, for instance. You know, this was right at the cusp when no one had done a movie full of CG effects ever. In fact, um, I had the good fortune of being involved in the movie that created the first CG effect ever in the history of film, and that was young Sherlock Holmes. And the visual effects supervisors were Dennis Muren and John Lasseter. And I don't know how many people know that, that but it was the stained glass window that stepped yeah. into the church. And that was coming off um, another invention that happened inside Lucasfilm, which was the Pixar machine. The Pixar machine was actually creating CG effects in service to medical. Um, needs and then it carried over eventually into the movie business so the fact that I got to be there when the first wire model was used to have a dinosaur run across the screen was absolutely a game-changing moment there were five or six of us sitting in the theater Steven Spielberg and Dennis being two of them and we saw this wire model run across the screen and we all leapt out of our seats and were screaming because we'd never seen anything like that. And that began a process over time of realizing that we could create the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park in a way that no one had ever seen before. And there's nothing more exciting than to be involved in that kind of technological innovation when, when the story ideas that you're working on actually contribute to pushing the technology. I really, I believe that, that that's what's so exciting about our business, is that the imagination drives that kind of innovation and new design. Absolutely, and do you have a philosophy in deciding, you know, how much you use vision effects to tell the story? You know, how do you find the balance? You know, it's in interesting, that? this is a conversation we're having all the time right now in the development of F7. Um, we really... <laughs> You know, much like I'm sure many of you, that, you know, looking at all the Star Wars movies and getting a feeling for what even some of the early films did in combination with real locations and special effects, that's something that we're looking very seriously at. So we're going to find some very cool locations that we're going to use in support of F7. And, and I think we're, we're going we're gonna to probably end up using every single tool in the toolbox to create the look of these movies. That's what I, we're really excited about. What, um, I, I just wanted to, as a side note, just to tell you, there's some really lovely places in England to film. Oh, I, I know, I know. Uh, some nice mountains and things. Um, we could make somewhere look like a desert if you need it. I mean, 
We just went to have lunch. I had no idea that what he was going to ask me, but we were catching up on family and friends and talking about the movie business. And, and then all of a sudden, halfway through the lunch, he said, look, I, I don't know how much you know about my conversations about retiring, but I am thinking about slowing things down a bit and stepping aside, and I'd really like you to come in and run the company. And at first, I didn't really realize what <laughs> Um, but once I did realize what he said, I, I answered pretty quickly. Um, not because it seems obvious, because it, obviously I think there's a lot of people out there that would love to be a part of this company, and I strongly encourage you to do that. But it, it is, it, it, it's something that I realized was going to afford me an opportunity to take all the skills and all the things that I've done all these years throughout the movie business and be a part of something so much bigger. And now that, the, that Star Wars has been bought by the Walt Disney Company, it's become even bigger because it's what, the biggest media company in the world. And the opportunities that that affords us for Star Wars and the movies that we get to make inside the universe that George has created that's just, I, I mean, I can't think of anything more fun and more exciting than doing that. And uh, how about meeting as well to get a little bit more detail? Did George ever talk about you having to wear a plaid shirt or grow a beard at any point? Was that something that he, he was a requirement? No, well, the in the old days it used to be that you had to carry a cigar around if you were a producer. That's I haven't done any, no, I, I do have a plaid shirt. I have one. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, tell me around the, talk about the process of selecting J.J. Abrams as a director. What, what were you looking for and, and what do you think you got from, from him? Well, you know, an interesting thing is I've actually known J.J. Abrams since he was about 15. I'll tell you a, a funny story. So I, was, I was working as Steven Spielberg's assistant and a man called saying that he had found a box of Super 8 films all dusty in the basement of his house. And I thought, hmm, okay. Um, I didn't know if he was necessarily looking for money because he thought he found these films or what. So I was being cautious and I said, well, could you bring the box by the office and we'll take a look and see what it is. I hang up the phone, I ask Stephen if he knows anything about it. He said, yeah, I lost all the, the films that I made as a kid, and maybe that's them. So this man showed up with the box, and sure enough, inside were all these films that Stephen had made when he was 11, 12, 13 years old. And this man was unbelievably nice, wasn't looking for anything, and Stephen covered these films. So simultaneous to this, I'm reading an article in Variety, and these two kids in high school had won this video award. And I said to Steven, you know what would be great? Why don't we hire these guys to come in and clean your films and transfer them to tape? And he said, that's a great idea. And those two kids were J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves. <laughs> so the great thing is, Steven and I have kind of been at the forefront of watching JJ's amazing career in television and film. 
And when this opportunity came about, George and I started talking about what we thought was actually a very short list of people that we were considering to come in and, and launch episode seven. And JJ was at the top of that list. JJ embodies, I think, many of the qualities and, and a very similar personality to both George and Stephen. He has a sense of aspiration in what he does. His films tend to be hopeful. Um, they're fun and exciting. He, he understands how to use effects. Um, I, he's a great storyteller. He's a writer as well as a director. So I think he's gonna do an amazing job. And the, and the group of writers that we've assembled was Michael Art and Larry Kasdan and Simon Kinberg. It's, it, we couldn't have a better team in service to this movie. Really exciting. And then in your discussions, I mean, have you thought about how you're gonna balance sort of honoring the existing films and then at the same time, obviously, you've gotta create something fresh and new as well? There's no question, I mean, this is, I keep saying this, it is a daunting exercise. You guys probably know many more details than I do about everything inside the universe of Star Wars. So there's been an amazing education process that's had to go on with this. And conversations we had early on with George, where George, it was fantastic to just immerse ourselves with him day after day after day as he downloaded many of the ideas that he initially had about how he came up with all of this. Just understanding that and getting a really strong foundation for just how complex this world is that he's created and recognizing that these are important films to, to everybody here and everybody around the world who generationally now has grown up in this universe of Star Wars. We have to be careful with that. This is a huge responsibility associated with that, and we're all taking that really seriously.